I am Farha Khan. Welcome to Season 3 of Prof Talk on UBC CITR 101.9 FM. Prof Talk is back on the air and we'll be featuring live interviews every second Tuesday with professors right here at UBC. Today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Don Baker on the show. Dr. Baker studies the cultural and religious history of Korea. He received his PhD in Korean history from the University of Washington and has taught at UBC since 1987. He teaches the department's introduction to Asian civilizations for first year students as well as undergraduate and graduate courses on Korean history and thought. In addition, he teaches a graduate seminar on the reproduction of histor historical trauma in 20th century Asia. Dr. Don Baker joins me now in the CITR studio. Thank you, Don, for coming in today. Thank you for having me. Well, let's begin with talking about a recent conference right here at UBC that you were a big part of. Uh, it was the 10th annual international conference organized by the International Society for Korean Studies. Tell us about the conference. Who participated? Well, first of all, the International Society for Korean Studies was established to give North Koreans and South Koreans a chance to meet in neutral territory to get to know each other. So the organization is actually based in Osaka, Japan. <laughs> um, so we brought 10 North Korean scholars and 22 South Korean scholars, but it is international. We brought people from China, Japan, Bulgaria, Norway. Uh, a Cuban guy was supposed to come, couldn't make it at the last minute, somebody from Mexico. Uh, so we had people from all over the world, but it's primarily to give North Koreans and South Koreans a chance to get to know each other. Now, why is it important to have North Koreans and South Koreans together at a conference? Well, when they're back home, they can't talk to each other. There's no telephone communication, there's no email, there's absolutely no communication except when a few government officials will meet with government officials from the other side. And they were one people for a long time. I mean, Korea has been one country for over a thousand years, and it was split artificially in 1945. So we figured it will come back together again. But they've been going their separate ways now for over half a century. So it's very important that they get to know each other. So when the border between the two collapses, which I expect will happen sometime, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, that especially the North Koreans will have some idea what South Korea is like, because North Korea, they, they don't have internet access to the outside world, they know very little about what's going on in the outside world, so we want to bring these members of the North Korean elite, first of all to Canada, to see Canada, but also to meet South Korean scholars and see how scholarship is done in South Korea. So tell us about some of the presenters, what did they present on, in, with their, what mm -hmm. papers did they Presenting. South Koreans and North Koreans are very different. Uh, and South Koreans gave papers on a wide variety of really academic topics, Korean literature, Korean linguistics, uh, Korean history, even Korean economics. There was a paper on the rise of the Korean automotive in industry. The North Koreans, uh, three of the papers were very, very political, giving basically the North Korean government line. To, in North Korea now, the official policy is military first. So we had a paper justifying a military first policy. Another paper explaining that the ruling ideology of North Korea, which they call Juche, is the most scientific philosophy in the world today. <laughs> but other papers were real academic papers. They were on, um, on aspects of ancient Korean history, for example, which I found interesting. But we, all ten of the scholars have to, of course, follow the line given them by their government. They can't deviate from the government interpretation even of ancient history. Now, do they interact with each other apart from the general proceedings of the conference? Not at first they don't, but they, they, they started relaxing. The conference went on for three days, so by the third day they were relaxing. It, it, the South Koreans were always relaxed. I mean, <laughs> they've been a free society for quite some time. But it took a while for the North Koreans to feel comfortable. By the third day, they were sharing drinks with the South Koreans and talking with them and, and some, uh, smiling. So it was, that's what we want to see. We want to see them getting to know each other as people. Now, what did you present on? I'd actually present because I was there organizing it. Oh. <laughs> and then I was elected the international president, so I'm going to oh. organize the next conference in two years. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll make sure it's not at UBC. It was a lot of work. <laughs> I bet it was. So overall, it was a success. It definitely was. It was. It's the biggest conference we've ever had of that organization, because I think because it was in Canada. Um, but usually we meet, we met once in, in, uh, in the UK, we usually meet in China or Japan. Uh, but again, it was a, the, the North Koreans looking around in Vancouver could see that maybe North Korea is not the paradise they've been told it was. I mean, they're told that everybody in the world envies them, and all they have to do is look around our campus, and they can see a lot of people envy us. <laughs> <laughs> and watching a North Korean who had to give a paper that was vetted by his government, he give his paper and then sit and listen to an American former reporter for the Asian Wall Street Journal talk about the rise of the South Korean automotive industry. Now, I couldn't talk to him about it. He couldn't say anything that would deviate from the government line, but you know those wheels in his head are turning. Uh, he might, I, don't, I don't think he had any clue 
um, that South Korea is now a major player in, in world automotive markets. I don't think the North Koreans are aware of that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it was, it was, in some ways, probably eye-opening for a lot of individuals. I think so. I think so. Because these people, the North Koreans, are from the government-selected elite. But so they're true believers in their system. But at the same time, they will be the ones, if the transition to a united Korea comes within the next five or ten years, they'll be the ones leading that transition. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that they get exposed uh, to the outside world, to what's going on in South Korea and in Canada. Well, I'd like to start talking more about you. And uh, let's just talk about some of your beginnings. Uh, why Korea? Why <laughs> have you dedicated most of your life to studying that part of the world? Yeah. It was actually kind of accidental. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Louisiana in the United States, wanted to get out of there. In the 1960s, I saw a notice that the U.S. government had a lot of money then, and they were willing to take undergraduates from deprived educational environments, such as Louisiana State University, <laughs> I didn't have an Asian language, and send us to Hawaii to study an Asian language. And I thought, I don't care about Asian languages, I want to go to Hawaii, all expensive to pay. And I had to choose either Chinese or Japanese at that point, they didn't have Korean. Uh, studied Chinese, then got interested in Asia, uh, came back, finished my degree at Louisiana State University, uh, wanted to get over to Asia, but there was no way to go to Taiwan with somebody else paying. <laughs> uh, but there was U.S. Peace Corps in Korea. So I said, oh, okay, I'll try Korea. And got there and fell in love with the place. I mean, it, uh, at first the people are difficult. Korea is not really friendly to outsiders at first. But once they get to know that you're not there to make fun of them, that you eat their food and live in their homes and are teaching their kids, they're the closest friends you can have in the world. So within six months, <laughs> I had, the first six months were tough, but after about six months, I had some very close friends who were still friends of mine, you know, 40 years later. And I was determined so little scholarship is available in English on Korea, particularly traditional Korea. We used to say that most, mo most North Americans that thought of Korea would think of the TV show MASH, but now they're taking Hyundai cars um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Samsung and LG. Um, but back then, that's what it was. And so there was very little available. I figured, hey, this is great. I can go into Korean studies, and I won't have much competition for a job. But I didn't realize that there weren't many jobs. <laughs> but I luckily got one at UBC. <laughs> now, you started the Korean studies program here at UBC. That's right, I did. Uh, I was it. There was one professor in sociology who was writing about Korea, but his department didn't believe he'd have enough students if he offered a course on Korea. Mm -hmm. When he finally was allowed to do that, the course filled up right away. Right. But I had to teach Korean language and history uh, all by myself the first few years. Now, you're a pre-modern historian. That's right. Right. So tell us about what you, you focused on, uh, at least uh, some of your research is focused on. I say pre-modern. I mean, the guy I've spent much of my career writing about, I'm still working on, died in 1836, which actually in the Korean context is pre-modern. Um, and I was studying him because he was one of the first Koreans to take Western ideas seriously. He was, he's a famous scholar. They respect him in both North and South Korea. He was in exile for 18 years because of an involvement with an illegal Catholic church. Oh. <laughs> uh, his brother was executed. He was thrown in exile. During those 18 years, he, re he could read and write, and he wrote constantly about all kinds of things. But he was a Confucian at heart, so I was trying to see how Confucianism and Western notions of nature and also Western notions of ethics and Western notions of God would fit into uh, the Confucian philosophy. Okay. Now you've had to master the Korean language in doing yeah. all of this research. How have you done that? How have, is it been many trips to back and forth to Korea, or did you mm -hmm. study initially and, and that was it? First of all, to do the work I do, you have to know two languages, because before the 20th century, Koreans wrote in classical Chinese. The man I study has gotten 20 volumes of his writings all in Chinese, and I haven't seen a single thing in Korean. But as far as the Korean language goes, I would say I have to know Korean to read modern scholarship and to talk to Korean scholars. Basically, I had five hours a day of Korean language class for 10 weeks in Peace Corps. Then they sent me to Gwangju, the city of Gwangju, and the um, provincial capital there, to live with a family that didn't speak English. <laughs> so you learn Korean fast that way. <laughs> And how, how do you feel your Korean has progressed over the years? Do you feel that it just gets better and better with time? Always learn new stuff, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I have no trouble uh, carrying on conversations in Korea. If I have to give a formal lecture, I've got to prepare, but otherwise I have no trouble. But the Korean attitude towards foreigners speaking Korean has changed. When I was there in 1970, I first went there in 71, if I would just say a few words in Korean, people would go, oh, your Korean's so good. But now there's so many foreigners in Korea who speak Korean. Last year, I actually was walking down the street by myself, and a young Korean woman walked up to me to ask directions in Korean. Right. How did she know that I know Korean? Mm -hmm. She's it's assumed now that foreigners in Korea know Korean. Right. 
Right. I was amazed at that. It hadn't happened before. Now, there were different dialects uh, yes, there in are. Korea. So what dialect did you learn? I learned the dialect in Gwangju, which was in the southwest. And it's, um, speaking the Gwangju dialect in Korean is like if I go back in my native Louisiana accent of English, saying hello in, in uh, Gwangju Korean is kind of like saying, how y'all doing in English? You know? <laughs> it sounds like I'm a country bumpkin, <laughs> what it sounds like. So have you retained that accent all these years? I have. It's not as strong as it used to be because I spent much of my time in the last 20 years when I'm in Korean Seoul. Right. But it still comes out even when I don't want it to. It's, people <laughs> will say, you studied in Kwangju, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I actually want to talk about Kwangju because okay. there are, it, it really correlates with the class that you're currently teaching right. in, in, grad, in graduate studies. And um, Kwangju has a, a very difficult history that, that you yeah. yourself witnessed um, yeah. in 1980. Yeah. Can you talk about that, or is it still difficult for you to talk about it what is. happened in May 1980 in Kwangju? It is difficult. People in Kwangju don't want me to talk about it. Now, again, I'm a pre-modern historian, so I was in Korea in 1980 writing my doctoral dissertation on 18th, 19th century Korea. But Kwangju was a city I lived in for three years when I first went to Korea. So when I heard that Kwangju was being attacked by special forces of the South Korean military in May 1980, I had to smuggle myself into the city to see, first of all, if my friends there were still alive, and my close friends were, and to see what was going on. Um, and there was a military coup in May 1980, and Kwangju was the home base of the man who would have won a free presidential election, Kim Dae-jeon, who later did win in 1997 and went on to get the Nobel Peace Prize. But the, the military, in order to smash all opposition, decided to attack this, the city of 700,000, that was Kim Dae-jeon's home base, and they didn't send regular army. They didn't even send riot police. They sent special forces and paratroopers. And it was incredible. And seeing that, I, and knowing, first of all, the first decade after that, you couldn't talk about it in South Korea. I was determined to tell the story. And I've been telling the story ever since. Even today, even though it's legal now to talk about it, it's officially called the Kwangju Democratization Movement. It's still difficult for Koreans to talk about it. People from Kwangju know that the rest of Korea don't understand what went on. It's, mm -hmm. it's, if you didn't see the carnage, it's hard to imagine it. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Well, a reporter from one of the most conservative newspapers in Korea described it as human hunting. Mm -hmm. You had paratroopers with bayonets just running through crowds and, and stabbing people, and then kicking them with their paratrooper boots, and they fell down. Mm -hmm. um, it was absolutely incredible. Um, the only way to describe it is a massacre. And as an historian, I've studied people who've been dead a long time. Mm -hmm. and But having to watch the city that I did, my Korean hometown, I call it, it's the city that taught me to love Korea. Watch it attack that way, and then see how difficult it was to get the rest of Korea to understand what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very frustrating. Um, so I've been dealing with this ever since. But as an historian, I also have to deal with the fact that I'm supposed to teach history objectively. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to me to be objective about something I feel so deeply about. And so uh, that's why I created this course, is to look at how other issues that are very emotional for those who live through them are lived in the immediate aftermath and heard a lot about them from the family who lived through it. How do you talk about these things? How do you reproduce them? What do you do? You, you write novels. You make films. You do academic studies. Um, you try to find some way to understand why something so horrible happened. I mean, why can people be that cruel to someone else? I mean, these are Koreans killing Koreans mm -hmm. for absolutely no reason whatsoever except their, their commanding officer told them to. Uh, and you have, you know, Korea's not the only place this has happened, right? In this class, we look at the Cultural Revolution in China, we look at the uh, atomic bombing in Hiroshima, we look at the partition of India, we look at the killing fields of Cambodia. The 20th century is full of episodes like this. The number of dead in Kwangju is much less than you'd find in, in Hiroshima, obviously, or the partition of India or Cambodia. Um, the official figure is 268, I think it's more like 1,000. Um, but to me, it means a lot because those are my people. Mm -hmm. And also because it's not that well known. And so I, I created this class to help me deal with this whole issue of how do, you, as, how do you come up with an objective understanding of something that you're personally involved with. Um, but also I wanted to have an excuse to get exposed more people uh, to what happened there because it's not very widely known that this fifth largest city in Korea at the time was attacked by their own army, by special forces who came in and were, t and were, sh were, were shooting in, in the unarmed crowds and then bayoneting those who ran away. And so 31 years later, has, is it any easier to talk about, or do you still find that you get choked up? Get choked up, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's still difficult. I've been doing a lot of reading on it the last few days, and it's, it, when it gets too realistic, it's difficult. And I'm not the only one. I mean, uh, 
the, the Asian Wall Street Journal reporter I mentioned who talked to my conference about the automotive industry. He was a, a reporter in Kwangju at the time, and he still chokes up when he talks about it. Mm-hmm. People in Kwangju, it takes a while to open up and talk about it. First of all, they have to know you, and sometimes it takes a little alcohol before they can talk about it because they're very painful memories. You, know, you, you never forget seeing people killed. Mm-hmm. No matter how many years it's been, you don't forget it. Mm-hmm. Let's see when they're innocent people and killed for what apparently is no reason. Uh, it's something that sticks with you the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. I'd like to now talk about um, your book because this is a, uh, a big project <laughs> that you're taking or mm-hmm. under, undertaking at the moment. It's a, as far as I understand, a uh, history of Korea. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you begin and how do you take on a project like that? It's, uh, well, I take my lecture notes and cut them in half because they, <laughs> they basically. Cambridge University Press wants a survey history of Korea from the earliest times to the present day in 300 pages or less. So I've got, you know, five volumes, histories of Korea in Korean, and most English language histories of Korea are five or six hundred pages. Um, and they're leaving out a lot of stuff. So um, I, what I'm doing is trying to look at how the Koreans have defined what it is to be Korean. And there tends to be a belief in Korea, as there are in many countries, that there's always been a Korean people. And I argue, you know, they took them, took them a while to see themselves as one people, took uh, uh, millennia. Uh, and how did that happen? How did they see themselves as, first of all, different from the Chinese and Japanese, but secondly, as one people on this peninsula? Mm-hmm. And, um, and then how did they express that difference? How was it expressed linguistically? The Korean language is quite different from Chinese, for example. How they expressed it culturally? How they expressed it by writing their histories? How they expressed it through their art, their music? And also how they've been, Korea is amazing because it managed uh, to survive major invasions from, from the north, I would say from China, but invasions were from the Mongols and the Manchu, um, and also from China over their history, that they managed most of the time to maintain autonomy. When the Mongols conquered China, for example, they conquered Korea, but they let the Korean king stay on the throne. When the Manchu out of Manchuria in the 17th century conquered China, they still let the Korean king stay on the throne. The last dynasty of Korea lasted over 500 years with the same royal family the whole time. How do they do that? They're not that big of a country. Japan's bigger, China's a lot bigger. Mm-hmm. And if they manage to keep their, their national and cultural and linguistic and everything identity all this time, and it's quite an amazing feat. Um, and also, of course, I'll go up to the modern period. What I have to tell in my book is how the Koreans have brought about this incredible transformation of their country. I went there for the first time in 71. They were a poor country living under military rule. Now they are a very prosperous country and they're democratic. Mm-hmm. And they've done that in four decades. And with a relatively a low loss of life. I mean, Kwangju was the worst case of violence. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. And in 1971, nobody thought that Korea would look like it does now. Mm-hmm. We expected it to be poor for a long time. It didn't seem to be going anywhere. We began seeing signs of change, but the rapid pace of change has been dizzying so much so that the, my students, undergraduate students of Korean background can't imagine when I talk about Korea 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. That's not the Korea they know. The Korea they know is the Korea when people have automobiles, private automobiles, mm-hmm. when people have indoor plumbing. I mean, in 1971, the only automobiles were, were uh, taxis. <laughs> and I had to, there was no indoor plumbing. I take a bath, I had to go down to the public bathhouse. <laughs> um, and the toilet was across the courtyard, <laughs> a little <laughs> hole in the ground, basically. Uh, what a change now. It, it's, and to be able to share this with the students so they can be, understand what their parents accomplished, what I try to do when I work with Korean students. You know, it's quite an accomplishment. And so what do you hope to really accomplish with the book in terms of um, how you know, the average person perceives Korea mm. today? I'll have two audiences. One would be people who don't know Korea, mm-hmm. and I'll introduce them to Korea, let them know, first of all, it is a distinctive civilization. It's not China, it's not Japan. It's been distinctive for a long time. Mm-hmm. And Korea has contributed a lot to world civilization. Korea had the world's first movable metal type back in the, in the 13th century. Uh, they had the world's first ironclad navy uh, in the 16th century. Uh, and of course, they've had this tremendous economic progress in the, in the 20th century. So that's for the non-Koreans. For the Koreans, I want them to see uh, how Korea came to be Korea, you know, how it managed to survive, as it is, and how the various peoples on the peninsula managed to, to stay, keep from being Chinese or Japanese and then managed to coalesce as one Korean people. Even after 1945, when the Soviet Union and the United States split the country for the first time in a thousand years, it was split in the North and South Korea. 
no geographic reason, no linguistic reason, just a political reason. And yet they still maintain a sense of being one people. So I want my Korean students to see how their ancestors have managed to preserve this distinctive Korean identity despite all the pressures around them, despite the dangerous neighborhood in which they live. Mm -hmm. And when do you anticipate it will be published? Uh, my publisher thought it'd be this November. It's not going to be. <laughs> It'll be another year or two. <laughs> Professors are always late with their deadlines. That's right. Well, it's been it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. I, I want to save some time because I want to play some music um, uh, that commemorates the um, Gwangju massacre. Um, that uh, I will um, just pull up now, but I think it will it will complement. Probably or bring back probably a lot of feelings that you still ha harbor mm -hmm. after 31 years, and and in, it's interesting because given that you learned about Korea in you know Kwanju or that's where what you call it's what you call your hometown, you also witnessed a very horrific event, and so that in some ways must must bring you in some I guess closer to to the place and to the people, and it will probably be you know for the rest of your life. People in Kwanju who know I was there in 1980 feel like I'm one of them. Uh, so, um, I think I will end the show and with that, with a piece of music. Um, for those of you who've just turned, uh, tuned in, my name is Farha. I, uh, I host a show called Prof Talk. We're back on the air. This is the third season uh, on UBC CITR 101.9 FM. I've just been speaking with Professor Don Baker, and it's been a real pleasure to have him on the show today. Um, if you would like to know more details about his research, uh, please visit the Asian Studies website. It's www.asia.ubc.ca. And if you would like to hear an audio or a video podcast of this show um, or any previous episode of Prof Talk, please visit proftalk.ubc.ca. And I'm going to end the sh um, today's show with a piece of music from Korea titled March for the Beloved. It's a tribute to the innocent dead of the Kwangju massacre in Korea in 1980. Here it is. I'm Farha Khan. Thank you for listening today. comes from this um, this CD of it's called Pansori, which is traditional Korean music. This is not Pansori, they, they started with this. Yeah. The Pansori, That's the right title, right? I got it from YouTube. I believe it is, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But those, yeah. Those are the real pictures. Yeah. I know it was hard for me to look at, but the music is I wanted to cut the interview so I could play the full oh. full uh, oh. piece because otherwise what happens the next show comes in and then they cut it off. Oh, right. This is something and, yeah. And um, the whole C D I I thought I performed live in the in, in year 2000.